Playoffs, it's your boy, the Black Bandit. Welcome to the playoffs. 32 teams started the season. 256 games later, only 12 remain. This week, eight of the 12 teams are playing in the wild card round. Ironically, all four of the week, uh, weekend's matchups are rematches from previous playoff matchups. Wild card weekend's first matchup is a matchup that was staged just exactly a year before the Bengals heading to Houston to take on the Texans. Now, the Texans started out 11-1, but they came down the stretch pretty badly, losing three of their last four, including their last, losing their last two to the Vikings and the Colts. The Bengals started 3-5 and five and then ripped off 7 of 8, coming down the back half of the stretch to claim the second wild card. Now, the Texans are very offensively balanced. Matt Schaub is a... Good passer, though he has struggled as of the last three or four games. Arian Foster, um, he's a, a solid runner, second in the AFC in rushing, but he has kind of tailed off lately. He sat out most of the game against the Vikings uh, and didn't play that much in the season finale against the Colts. Now, the Bengals have been playing with rock solid defense. They have been holding teams to under uh, they call all but one of their opponents in their 7-1 stretch to under 20 points and that one time that they held they were they had more some scored more than 20 points on them was exactly 20 and their loss against the Cowboys now I'm looking at the uh, matchup and everything should say that the, the way the numbers come out Texans are better offensively. They have a stud defensively in J.J. Watt. They've had 44 sacks on the season. They're good at pressuring the quarterback. They can shut down offenses. But the Bengals, on the other hand, have one of the most underrated defensive units in the NFL. Geno Atkins having 12 and a half sacks. The Bengals lead the NFL in sacks with 51. This is a team that plays good defense, really good defense. Bengals offense, they have a good runner, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis. He's nowhere near on the level of Arian Foster, but he is a service of running back. Andy Dalton and A.J. Green are fast becoming one of the big name quarterback receiver combos. A.J. Green heading to his second Pro Bowl. The numbers say that the Texans should roll. There's a feeling around that the Bengals could pull the upset. The Bengals are way overdue for another flat performance. They have a tendency to wander mentally in games, with games that they should be blowing out, blowing teams out, but they are clearly better, i.e. the Steelers, the Ravens, the Cowboys. They've kind of slept walked through. Now, the Cowboys game came back to bite them in the butt. They were managed to get past the Steelers and the Ravens, but I don't think that they're going to get past Houston. As much as my heart wants to see the Bengals finally break a 23-year-old playoff string, uh, uh, 23 years of not making, uh, not winning the playoffs, I can't see them doing it this year. Now, I wish I had could say something different, but I see Houston moving on in this game. Saturday's second game is a game that's pretty near and dear to my heart. If you couldn't guess, with the Vikings duds. Vikings and Packers tangle in Lambeau Field. It's the second time that the Vikings and Packers have ever played in the playoffs. The Vikings uh, upset the Packers in the 2004 playoffs with Randy Moss catching a pair of touchdown passes from, from Dante Culpepper in a 31-17 upset. Now, the teams have drastically changed since then. Um, Aaron Rodgers is one of the best, if not the best quarterback in the NFL and has excelled against Minnesota in his last five games. He's a 132.5 passer rating, has thrown 16 touchdowns against one interception. This team runs on Aaron Rodgers. As he goes, so go the Packers. The Packers have a negligible running game, if any. They've used pretty much a comedian running back and are using more of bubble screens and short passes to uh, offset any kind of lack of any kind of running game. Now, on the other hand, the Vikings have the best running back in the game, Adrian Peterson. 
He is running his 2,097 yards, carried the Vikings all year. Uh, he's had eight games with over 150 yards, which, which ties Earl Campbell for an NFL record. His running keeps the Vikings in the game, dominates the time of possession. As he goes, so go the Vikings. If he doesn't get his touches, if he doesn't get the ball and get lots of yards, Vikings aren't going to win this game. The, the Packers have way too many offensive weapons, and Aaron Rodgers can light up a scoreboard at will. He's done it to plenty of other teams. Now, the Packers on defense, Clay, start with Clay Matthews and go from there. Matthews is a player that you have to keep an eye on at all times. And Packers will be looking, uh, be uh, they will have Charles Woodson coming back from a collarbone injury in the secondary. Now, how effective he's going to be is going to be anybody as anybody's guess. The Packers are going to just stack the box. They're going to put a nine in the box and dare Adrian Peterson to beat them. Adrian Peterson may get his yards. I mean, he's had two games. We said close to, he said all, almost 200 yards in both games. He had 199 uh, last week in week 17 against the Packers. And he had 210 in their earlier December meeting. The Packers may be willing to give Peterson his yards and his touches, but they do not want a repeat of the week 17 where Christian Ponder was able to complete intermediate passes able to throw short curls, short out routes, short passes that was able to keep defenses relatively honest. They're going to stack the box against Peterson. I mean, that's everybody and their brother who runs the defense thinks, stop Peterson, you stop the Vikings, make Christian Ponder beat them. My thought is, and I know everyone's going to say, you're a homer, you're just going to go after your team. Something keeps telling me that the Packers cannot stop Peterson enough to make that big of a difference. And Christian Ponder made two big mistakes in the first matchup. He threw two critical interceptions that killed drives. In the rematch, he made no mistakes. Christian Ponder is, doesn't have to be Brett Farr. He doesn't have to be uh, uh, Dante Culpepper. He doesn't have to be Jeff George. What he has to be is somebody who's going to limit the mistakes and throw just enough passes to keep defense, to keep the Packers' defense honest. And I think that he's going to do it just enough that the Vikings steal the game. It's going to make a lot of people mad because a lot of people are, are convinced that the Packers are going to walk over the Vikings. But I think that the Vikings have enough to pull the upset. Now, Sunday's game features the Indianapolis Colts against the Baltimore Ravens. The Colts having won 10 games and returning to the playoffs after a year absence after a disastrous 2-14 campaign in 2011. They've been drawing off the inspirational uh, fight of their head coach, Chuck Pagano, who has successfully battled leukemia. And they have been playing behind the uh, talented rookie, Andrew Luck, who has been throwing passes with the calm, steady coolness of his predecessor, Peyton Manning. Now, the Baltimore Ravens, though they won the AFC North, have kind of sputtered down the stretch as of late. They've lost four of their last five, with the exception of thrashing the Giants uh, a couple of weeks ago. The Ravens really haven't been playing that well. Why they have not been utilizing Ray Rice, uh, his running is something that when the Ravens use Ray Rice, when he has over 20, 25 carries a game, they're a formidable team. But when they don't utilize him, they're a bit skittish. Joe Flacco, as much as he likes to think he's an elite quarterback, he's not. He's a decent quarterback. He's not as bad as, say, a Christian Ponder. But no one's ever going to mistake him for Aaron Rodgers, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees. No one's ever going to put him in that class. He's a good quarterback. He's a decent quarterback. But if the Ravens decide they're going to bank their playoff fortunes on him and what he can do, if they go as Joe Flacco goes, they're going to go right out the door. 
I'm counting on two things. A pair of rays. That Ray Rice is going to have plenty of carries. He's going to be able to run on a very weak Colts defense. Run defense, which is fourth worst in the NFL. And second, the other Ray, the comeback, or to say the finale, home finale of Ray Lewis. Longtime Baltimore Ravens linebacker who has been sitting out pretty much a good part of the season due to a torn tricep. He's able to come back. He's going to be able to play. And you can bet when he does that little wiggle shake dance that he does in introductions, the crowd is going to absolutely go bonkers. They're going to feed off of the energy that he's presenting. The Ravens are going to feed off the crowd's energy. And the Colts are going to get slammed. This game may be tight for a while, but the Colts are just not ready to hang with the Ravens. Ravens aren't a good team, but they're good enough to beat the Colts. Now, the weekend's final game is uh, the Seattle Seahawks traveling to our nation's capital, take on the Washington Redskins. The uh, Redskins have been in a bit of playoff mode already, seeing they had to defeat the Dallas Cowboys in Week 17 to win the NFC East. The Seahawks have been a offensive juggernaut the last four or five weeks. They scored 58 against the Cardinals, 50 against the Buffalo Bills, uh, 43 against the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, both teams have um, prodigies at quarterback, rookies running the show, Russell Wilson for the Seahawks and Robert Griffin III for the Redskins. Now. The Redskins have, I think, one of the most underrated rookie running backs that have come down the pike in quite a while by the name of Alfred Morris. He's had over 1,600 yards rushing and is a great complement to RG3 in keeping defenses from strictly keying on him and his ability to run. The run option game that they have implemented has suited them very well. And the team has played very, very well over the last seven, eight weeks. They've won their last seven straight. Now, the Seahawks, it took a little while for Russell Wilson to really establish himself as the uh, Seahawks starting quarterback. But as he has grown in the position, the team has flourished. Not to mention the Seahawks' defense, big play, ball hawking, opportunistic defense, have put up some points of their own, and they have shut down opposing offenses. That said, this is a West Coast team headed east. They're not playing this game in Century League Field. They were playing this game in Century League Field. They're playing this game in Seattle. I take Seattle. I take the Seahawks in an instant, but they're playing in Washington D.C., Landover, Maryland. If you want to be technical about it, but they're playing on the East Coast. I just am so leery of taking the Seahawks. It's easy to say Seahawks have been playing well. But maybe we can get the Redskins have been playing well. I'm going to take the Redskins. Some people might say it's an upset because the Seahawks are three point favorites. But I'm taking the Redskins to win the game at home. And there you have it. Okay, to recap, I'm taking the Texans, the Vikings, the Ravens, and the Redskins to win in the wild card round and move on to face the four teams that are sitting on their respective bark or loungers in their man caves watching them with attached interest. So we got four games this week, four games next week. If you uh, want to subscribe to the newsletter, just drop me a line at kjgreen920 at gmail.com and I'll put you on my mailing list. If you have any other questions or comments, you can send me an email there as well. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you next week.